Good morning. Good morning from Australia and good evening to our panellists, our distinguished panellists who are in the US and welcome to our extremely important topic today on dictatorships. And as uh, this is a US summit, we will be focusing mostly on uh, a US context for that uh, extremely significant topic. I am very lucky to uh, be able to introduce to you our panelists joining us today. Uh, from my right, we have uh, William Cohen, who is a special correspondent for Vanity Fair, and he's written some very significant articles with regards to Trump and conflicts of interest, which I recommend you uh, have a look at. Oh, we have uh, another panelist has just joined us now. Um, this is, hi, Matoya Kitamura. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. It is <laughs> who is a, a venture capitalist. Um, do you want to just let us know your, your, your company um, to refresh my memory there, um, Mr. Kitamura? Kitamura? Sure, thank you. I, um, Welcome I, from Japan. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I'm the, I'm the only non-US based participant here. I, I'm based in Tokyo, Japan. It's 7.30 a.m. here. Um, I run a company <laughs> called North Village Investment. It's an investment company, more than venture capital. Um, I'm trying, um, we're managing funds, uh, private equity funds, and also um, investing directly into startup companies. Thank Fantastic. You. We're delighted to and, be here today. Yes, and uh, venture capital is, is a significant but under-discussed topic um, with regards to um, dictatorships because uh, where money goes, <laughs> dictators follow, right? Uh, and also here we have uh, in the middle of the screen uh, Asha Rangappa, who is a uh, Senior Lecturer, correct, from the Yale Jackson Institute for Global Affairs, uh, extremely studied on this subject, and I know she has a lot of um, really great points um, to add to it, so really looking forward to your contribution. And um, extremely honoured to have with us Mohammed Sultan, who is the president of the Freedom Initiative, which is a human rights organization in DC. And he's joining us from DC. Uh, Ash is coming from Hampton, Connecticut. And um, of course, our Vanity Fair correspondents joining us from New York. Um, Mohammed Sultan is um, extremely experienced on this topic, sadly, uh, having been imprisoned himself in, in Egypt, which um, I'm hopeful he will address for us. So there, you know, could be no greater expert uh, on this subject. He's now in, um, in DC. And I myself am a journalist and a documentary filmmaker. I have filmed broadly under many dictatorships, sadly, um, from filming extremely covertly under the Mugabe regime in Zimbabwe to interviewing the exiled leader of the Cambodian op opposition, <laughs> filming in Cuba um, and many other places, and also in the US and uh, Oakland in the um, Black Lives Matter protests being followed by police. Um, they ran past me. Um, so uh, I have a different expertise to bring to the subject, though I am actually Australian. I've been in the US for much of um, a decade. So let's kick off here. I guess a really important beginning point is to ask, you know, how did we get here? You know, who would have thought we would be having a panel on dictatorships at a U.S. summit, right? It's been shocking for everyone around the world. I think Matoya will um, agree with that, but particularly um, traumatic for um, the U.S. citizens to go through. Um, who, who'd like to jump off there? Um, I thought maybe, Asha, you would be really great to give us a little bit of background to how the U.S. ends up in this situation where we're even discussing dictatorships on your shores? Yeah, I mean, I think that there have been a number of different trends, um, probably over the last four decades that have brought us to this point. And, um, I'll, you know, I'll reference a, a few other scholars whose books I encourage you to read. Um, one of them, actually, a colleague of mine here at Yale, uh, wrote a book, um, a co-authored a book called Let Them Eat Tweets. Um, and it basically talks about um, the, the, the trend of the conservative party in the United States, the Republican Party, uh, particularly after the 1980s, to move towards 
plutocratic policies, uh, policies that benefit the very wealthy. Um, and that the problem in doing this is that, uh, you know, when you're having policies that benefit 1%, you, you can't really get votes. Um, it's very hard because most people, you know, don't want to uh, just make 1% of the population uh, very rich. And so there's been a strategy of um, essentially, uh, you know, creating an internal enemy of uh, basically creating culture wars, as we call them here in the United States, um, a sense that, you know, there's going to be a way of life that's lost, uh, really making um, cultural issues, abortion, gun rights, gay rights, immigration, all of these very hot button issues, sort of the you know, shiny object that keeps getting tossed around so that this other um, agenda can be pursued. Uh, and that includes the agenda to fill the judiciary, for example, with highly conservative uh, judges that will uphold like, you know, man tactics. You are creating a fertile ground for eventually, 20 years later, somebody with, you know, a demagogue to come up and really take advantage of these divisive uh, points. Of course, we have had a legacy of racism in this country since its inception, which is always a, you know, a, a button that can be um, used. And so I, I think that ground has been laid for a while. And I think what we're seeing is the chickens coming home to roost um, in many ways of what the natural endpoint is. When you decide to see politics as a zero sum game where mm -hmm. you cannot compromise um, or people have perceived that they can't compromise you know, or all is lost. Um, and so they must win at, at any cost. And I think, Sadly, January 6th represented this. I mean, this is where, this is what it was. It was, we cannot accept the outcome um, because mm -hmm. to do so, and I think there's a good chunk of the population that really believes that the country will be destroyed if, you know, it falls in the hands of the Democrats. I mean, that's how vilified we are and, uh, or, you know, these political, this polarization has become. Um, and I think that's, that's why we are where we are. Right. Wow. Very good point. A, a sad point to have to make, but I think that's really true. M Mohammed Sultan, how does that echo with with you and what you know of Egypt and then your time in the U.S.? So, I mean, uh, I, I think I think uh, this, this sort of strongman politics that we're seeing, the zero sum game that. Uh, Asha was just talking about and, and sort of if you in, in early 2000s, uh, if somebody, you know, with George Bush's democracy promotion, if somebody would have told you at that time that we would be seeing this sort of trend hit the United States uh, in 20 some years, I, I think people would have thought that you were crazy because the United mm -hmm. States as a leader of the free world as uh, sort of the, the beacon of hope for a lot of people. I mean, we, we saw um, the sort of that the Arab uh, world, sort of <laughs> the Arab Spring, and people, thousands, millions of of young Egyptians, Tunisians, uh, Syrians uh, around the Arab world demand their right to be to self determination, to uh, freedom, to justice, um, and had that for you know a brief second, and then sort of got overturned. I was I was a I was a victim of that, and as an Egyptian American, sort of seeing. Mm -hmm up in the Midwest, uh, always had this sort of dream about the Arab world having some sort of liberties or, 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 or freedoms that my, the American part of my identity enjoyed. And then almost seeing that dream being realized in Tahrir Square and going to Tahrir Square, joining the revolution, all of that, and seeing that overturn in a period of uh, not even two years uh, where the, the, the military literally turned its guns against its own citizens and uh, killed over a thousand people in broad daylight uh, while the world watched and did nothing. And, and sort of seeing that trend, seeing, and then coming back here uh, and then being shot, getting imprisoned, tortured, 
uh, getting sent to life in prison for literally tweeting, for literal tweets, like 140 characters. It wasn't even 280 characters as we have it today. Um, wow. And then seeing a bipartisan sort of Senator McCain working with President Obama to help get me out of prison. And then getting out of prison and seeing sort of and working with Senator McCain and President Obama on a bipartisan level to sort of see that to get other people released. And then seeing that divulge into the Trump era where you can't get a single Republican member to be, uh, uh, you know, the Senate or the House to be vocal about any of these issues. And you see that all the way leading, and I live miles away from the Capitol, and I, we, we, do, we work on advocacy, so we're on the Hill and almost every single day. We see these halls that people are in, and seeing those halls uh, uh, being ransacked by uh, people who have been misled with misinformation, disinformation campaign, and seeing that violence in the same halls where we sort of advocated for freedom, uh, for liberty, for democracy, it was just, it was, it, it was crazy. It was honestly like a really bad nightmare. I thought I was back in, in, in you know, and I, I, I can say that because I'm from the Arab world, but seeing this, uh, these, the strongman politics, this sort of centralization of power, this, uh, uh, um, Disinf these disinformation and misinformation campaigns that are trying to create a different reality because the strong man spoke them in this uh, in this what's it called on Twitter and so that that to me I I think seeing that and seeing sort of how we were thankfully able able to sort of surpass that a little bit make makes me a little hopeful but also knowing what I know about the Middle East and the Arab world and. It went from being a very safe place for you, especially after your experience in Egypt, to becoming an unsafe place again, right, in those halls of power, it sounds like. Yeah, that really is a, echoed my experience too. I was having, you know, meetings at uh, Capitol Hill with Senator McGovern about Zimbabwe human rights, uh, you know, discussing extremely sensitive and important topics about dictators, and then it became a situation where, you know, I was reporting about... Um, uh, you know, Russian links to, with Kushner for, for guiding US. And I, you know, I was getting, the, you know, I was getting strange people coming up from the State Department, you know, talking to me at the airport, you know, Starbucks, where are you off to? Where have you been? You know, I mean, that, that sense that I was now being followed was, was unbelievable. And I remember as, as um, Trump was being elected, just what you were saying, no, everyone thought you were crazy. At that time, I was saying, you know, you have to be worried about dictatorships here. It's like, come on, not in the US. Um, so anyway, Bill, uh, William Cohen, that must echo your experience a bit. Have you found yourself sort of censured at all? Or as, as a journalist, has it changed um, the way you've been able to operate? No, I, I wouldn't. I don't. I haven't found that at all. I mean, that would sort of be the final shoe to drop if uh, Trump or you know Trump's attorney general were to come after journalists. Uh, you know, thankfully that hasn't happened. There are, of course, unfortunately, other ways people come after journalists with threatening legal letters or sort of. Twitter mob or a Facebook mob, but uh, I would say, generally speaking, I've I've not experienced that, and I've certainly written right. plenty critically of uh, about Trump, uh, both before he became president and while he was president. Uh, so I think I've basically been spared that. But I, I think you know you have to to remember here that um, Trump began this escapade in June of 2015 when he came down the escalator. And Trump Tower is kind of a, a marketing ploy uh, to sort of raise his profile and his quote unquote brand because he likes to be at the center of attention. Um, I think uh, it surprised him uh, and the people around him uh, how effective his message became politically uh, and his 
technique of, uh, of you know, bashing uh, every other candidate on the stage and effectively diminishing them and showing what a tough guy he was. Uh, and even, you know, despite doing that and becoming the Republican nominee, which still blows me away, uh, and then uh, defeating Hillary Clinton because I think there are just a lot of people in this country who didn't want a woman, didn't want a woman president, didn't want another Clinton president. You know, she sort of abdicated her campaigning in key states like Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan, taking them for granted when she shouldn't have. And then uh, somehow, uh, even on election night, I think he was dumbfounded by the fact that he actually won. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and did not have the clue of how to govern. And so to some extent, you know, don't, don't forget, he didn't win the popular vote. He stitched together a electoral college win, which is another fluke of our system. Um, and so I think that by and large, to some extent, he, he was a fluke candidate, a fluke right. victor, uh, but he obviously represents a very deep strain of of, of concern and dissidence in, in American society. Um, and I think the bigger fear is that somebody will come along who's a better politician, a better package, and will uh, be much more effective politically than Donald Trump proved to be. So, I, I mean, I, I think we were you know, discussing something about this idea. Is, is Trumpism over then in your idea because he, he was a fluke candidate. It was a sort of one-off who couldn't govern and so he became more and more of a strong man taking advantage of his seat of power. Does that mean there's hope on the horizon then and it's, it's I mean, all... If you're asking me, I, I think that uh, you know, Biden's election proves there's hope, proves that the American people you know, sort of got their act together. I, I think you know, so far the first 50 days have shown that there's clearly a very different way to govern. And I think, you know, over time, Trump will certainly fade as a phenomenon. I don't buy into this 2024 phenomenon. Whether uh, Trumpism will fade, you know, remains to be seen. I think this idea that you know, people are trying to position themselves as to take the mantle of his, you know, coattails and, you know, see if they can ride it to 2024 remains to be seen. Uh, I have my doubts, but, but I don't think... <laughs> It's, you know, necessarily going away because the things that he supposedly was fighting for and representing for, uh, representing people about, he didn't accomplish any of those things that he promised. So the basic underlying concern that those people were frustrated by in our society uh, more than likely still exists. Mm hmm. Uh, Asha uh, Rangafa, you were shaking your head there. So please, I, I mean, jump in and Matoya, you please, you know, add, add to the conversation as, as you see fit. What what were you thinking there? And thank you, William, for those comments. Very good observation. Uh, no, I was just, I, I completely agree with, with William that other people have now, you know, observed these tactics and seen how successful they are. I mean, you know, the strongman playbook is pretty simple, right? Um, you, you know, find some out group, you vilify them, creating us versus them, you know, narrative, uh, you um, destroy credibility uh, in any other new, like in any other source of information other than the one that you are providing. So it's true that the press was not, you know, censored, um, but, you know, Trump really made the term fake news ubiquitous. To the point where, you know, there were journalists who were in danger at his rallies if they were from certain outlets. Um, you know, and I think, you know, just worldwide, we've seen an increase in violence on journalists. But it is this kind of breaking down of trust. And this is something that you and I talked about, Wendy, when we did our pre-interview. Um, I should add that when I was talking before about the plutocratic policies, the other thing that really sets a fertile ground for strongmen is extreme socioeconomic inequality. Um, and that is something that we have seen in the United States. I mean, the, you know, income inequality in the United States is uh, is increasing. Um, and that makes it easier to create the us versus them, because then you can blame the immigrants. You can blame the Asians. You know, they're the ones bringing disease. They're the ones taking your jobs. Um, they're the ones uh, changing your neighborhood. They're the ones taking away your heritage. All of these are narratives that are out there. 
add this with a very unique media ecosystem in the information age, um, you know, which, um, as Mohammed mentioned, allows people to actually live in different factual realities. Um, and, you know, that without any exposure to the facts. And frankly, uh, it doesn't even matter if they're exposed to the fact because beliefs at this point have become tribal. They're not actually based on accuracy. They are based, they are signifiers of what tribe you're in. Mm -hmm. so you think COVID, you know, if, if, you know, you don't believe that COVID is a hoax because you've actually like read studies and, you know, you, I think you've been convinced of it. it. You believe that COVID is a hoax because that is how you stay in this group and, and feel group solidarity and, you know, have a, 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 a sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. Once are to lose a common reality, you have no way for democracy to survive, right? right. If you don't even have like a, a starting point where you say, I, I think we can get from A to B in this way. And the other person says, I can go from A to B in this way. If you don't agree what A is, the democratic experiment is over. Um, mm -hmm. Because then what you have is someone who steps in and starts to tell you what, re you know, 1984, uh, don't believe your eyes and ears, you know, um, just believe what I tell you. Yeah. Tell you what reality is. Yeah. And what you're, you're speaking of really makes sense too. And even, you know, William Cohen, you're a different experience as a journalist than I had. It, it made me realize, well, you know, you're, you're an American, but coming through the border every time as a foreigner, that us versus them, I think, um, Mohammed Sultan and also uh, Matoya Kitamura would probably agree with this. You know, what you're talking about, Asher, is we became as foreigners instantly to a degree the enemy as well. I mean, we were the them. And um, the and people. the president of the United States called you the enemy of the people. That's right. That's right. And and also, you know, Black Lives Matter, et cetera. It was the us versus them. And we were the, the different, the scary. Um, so it was perhaps, I mean, not say, not undermining your, your experience at all, but perhaps uh, quite different for, for foreigners there. Um, let, let, let's hear a little from um, Matoya Kidamura. What is, I'm sorry, I'm probably mashing your name. Um, how does this resonate with, with you and your experience? And again, as a venture capitalist, you have to keep a very keen eye on the world and stability um, for your investments. And um, obviously there's you know, been a lot of talk about you know, whether investments in the US would, would suffer or uh, be, be considered more risky. Um, what, what do you think about, about all of these points, the important subjects we're, t we're raising here? Um, you know, it, it, the, the, the issue of Trump and, 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 and the so-called strongman politics really opens up many kinds of debate, even here. Uh, and we, it, it, it should be very shocking for you how, how often we talk about Trump here, not only in Japan, but also in Hong Kong, also in Taiwan, also in Korea. It's a, it's a worldwide topic. We see we're exposed to his news every every single day in, in some form or another uh, through SNS and, and, and the media. And I think um, um, so. So there's a lot to say. I think he's a product of not only the authoritarian ideas, but also many other things. Um, that's how I see it. Like, like a, for example, mistrust against uh, Beltway politics is one. I think his stra election strategy worked very well to to sort of dwell, uh, to add uh, the, um, the Republican votes to his original sort of reaching out to um, people who are left out uh, from, the, from the two big um, parties. It's also about SNS. I think it's, it's a lot about SNS. He used, um, try not to be positive here, but he, he, he revolutionized the usage of SNS in a very scary way, but he, he found a way to reach out uh, very emotionally uh, to his supporters and enhance uh, the momentum uh, using, you know, in many cases, basis, baseless ideas. But I think what we're struck with is not only the fact that um, uh, not only his methods, but the, the, but the fact that many uh, voters in the U.S. bought it. Um, it's very shocking. Um, mm. And it's not only about America, I think. You know, many Japanese intellectuals were quoting um, YouTube post, uh, uh, YouTube um, images that were posted by the Japanese version of QAnon. 
Um, and, you know, and yeah. it's very shocking to see how these people seriously back them up. Um, yeah, we and, and I think, so sorry, go on. Yeah, sorry. So it's, uh, it's, it's also about the public relations, um, that, 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 that's a new kind of public relations that, uh, the, the SNSs have, um, have, you know, mm. unfortunately functioned. So, um, I think for us, it's, it's also about rediscovering the U.S., to be honest. You know, from here, U.S. is viewed as a, a very modern model uh, democratic society which embraces multiple culture, multiple races, multiple ideas, multiple religions. And we've always admired that. We were made to admire that, to be, to be a little bit ironic here. But I think it's, there's a general idea that people idealize uh, the way uh, American decisions and, and, and we very f closely follow uh, the U.S. presidential elections and we were completely shocked by the 20, um, um, 2014, uh, 2016 uh, uh, presidential elections. Um, but There's a comment, a question on the side there that um, just yeah. made me remember, you've just had elections in Japan too. And I know when um, uh, Matoya and I were, were speaking briefly a few days ago, he was mentioning there was, you know, more coverage about the U.S. than there was of our own elections. Yes, and yes. It, uh, it's, it, I, yeah, there's a credit to the quality of uh, the, the media coverage. I mean, and I think, it, yeah, people in America don't realize, I mean, I know everyone rightly feels quite traumatized and Matoy was saying to me well so do we and I I felt the same like I don't know if you really and that was running as the headline in the Australian papers and I was thinking no it's it's not what we voted for. We're not even American, right? But it was it was almost like we all became sub sub um, states of America. That's how influential this yes. has been. Um, yes, it is. Yes. And the more and scandal, the more it recreated that and reinforced the news being about the U.S. to the point that it was like we were all we were all on this um, you know train wreck of a ride. Um, anyway, you know, um, can I, can I just say I just want to say one thing here that. Um, Matoya, you know, I had spent with my family two weeks in Japan in, uh, I think, 2018. And it was the best two weeks that I've spent in the last four and a half years because there was no Trump. I mean, I, I mean, maybe because obviously I don't speak Japanese, but we just were marveling in how the fact that we finally could get away from hearing about Trump and we had to go to Japan to do it. And wow. that was a delight. Well, <laughs> Probably I think I follow too good. much of the U.S. media. You know, um, it's I think there's a, there's a uh, element of SNS here as well. It's very easy now to follow uh, media coverage of other countries now, uh, thanks to the SNS. Uh, it was much easier compared with 10 years ago, to, um, mm -hmm. for example. Now you all you have to do is click New York Times, Washington Post, Fox News, CNN. Yeah. Um, Wall Street Journal, That's right. um, even Australian. I follow Australia, South China Morning <laughs> Post, and, and you you see the headlines every single day worldwide, and and you see the the different angles and and you know mm. all the detailed stuff that are about Trump, um, and you know we it's not like we we're, we're keen to learn what's happening to Trump every single day, but it it reaches us so easily. Yes. But isn't it a relief now to be done with that? You know, to be perfectly honest, we we're a little bit bored because of that. <laughs> it was out. Uh, it was. Yeah. Hurt. I was Jim talking to with my with my daughter and said, "A part of me is feeling bored. We we don't get to hear of and and you know be disgusted Ooh. with Trump anymore." That's right. <laughs> well, bore, boring is good because at some point, is good. Twitter was boring uh, is good. Trump, yes, Trump era. Tr Twitter was so much more. Uh, I guess stimulating than any Netflix show that you can put on, which is the right. <laughs> reality of our sort of state of affairs. You know, you, you know, I think it right. had a lot to do with, with right. the younger, younger generation. Like my 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 daughter is a was a high school student during the Trump years. She was traumatized when she saw Trump being elected. She was very disappointed to see Hillary Clinton being not ele elected, and he she was exposed to, to the similar level of 
exposure to Trump all, all, uh, throughout mm-hmm. the four year term. And I had mm-hmm. to explain to her after Joe Biden was elected, okay, this is the norm. It's not like we have to know about U.S. president's um, ideas and what he did, what he used to do, what he said every single day. That's not the norm. I had to explain to her that this is the norm, and I hope it stays that way. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of strongmen, I had to explain to my kids that it's actually not normal for for people to be dancing in the streets when, you know, an election is called in the United States. Like, that's what happens when dictators are toppled. Um, You know, that's that's how people react, Um, Mm -hmm. you know. Normally, you just have a very staid, you know, victory speech. And, and so even that, um, you know, that kind of reaction that we saw in the United States, um, you know, street parties or whatever kind of gay, like it was a release from, you know, this four years. And I think in many ways, we were all just sort of like hostages um, to this man. Um, and again, because of our media ecosystem, because it wasn't just that the headlines were there, he was creating the headlines. He was very good. Intentionally. He would suck the air out of the room and no matter what was happening, he could always make it about himself. And so, um, you know, so you're all, you know, there's a kind of just like, you know, weird psychological Stockholm syndrome kind of going on because, and that's probably why people are sort of, bored now because you like become weirdly dependent on this um either low level anxiety or just kind of adrenaline and uh whatever it is you know for for his supporters that kind of uh charged anger that he was able to really um generate in them and so i think the question for the future is who's the next person who can do that in some Mm. ways the hope the silver lining is I just don't see somebody like Ted Cruz or Josh Hawley. I mean, they're tools, you know what I mean? Like they're so, they talk about boring. I mean, they're, they have the Trumpist ideology, but they they don't have the charisma that a strong man needs. Like, you know, Trump was larger than life. He had a cult of, he's a cult of personality, um, like Mussolini, like Hitler. Or the irreverence. He had a certain irreverence that they don't have. He was outside the system, self-made man, so, or so he had us believe. I, I think that, you know, I think you could keep an eye on Tucker, Tucker Carlson. Like he has that kind of celebrity persona and also that demagogue or, you know, that um, demagogue rhetoric uh, that he, he plays to. Um, and that, you know, because I think we're, we're now in like the, the world of celebrity politics. I think that, you know, Kanye West, like why was he running for a president? We don't know. Like, but, <laughs> That's right. It, you know, yeah. it's no longer about qualifications. It's about you know, Twitter followers. Actually, you're talking, and this isn't a criticism, but noted you're talking only about men. Is there only the strong man that has the charisma? Have there been any women dictators? Not wanting to turn this totally off into a gender discussion, but it sort of is, is it sort of part of the package that it's the strong man we're talking about that has that charisma or the authority that people are looking to? Uh- who, who's the who's the um, um, influential politician in France? They had a female oh, version of the Donald Trump. Yeah. Marine 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 yes, but, but I, I was I was going to say we haven't had many women leaders in the first place to be able to judge if you yeah. know if they're strong women or, or or not or like you know strong men politics or whatnot. Um, so, but but. Yeah. I, I did want to. I did want to say. I mean, just sort of to, to, to the point that um, Toya was mentioning about the impact of the United States and what the, the politics of the United States and how it impacts. I think, as someone who's both an Egyptian and an American, um, how much the weight of the United States on the world stage and how much it impacts what happens here every election, how much it impacts. Li- tens if not hundreds of millions of people's lives in other mm-hmm. countries uh, uh, from a societal level, from an economic level. Mm-hmm. From- Thank 
that's and that's a that's a, a record low from 1995 and the way that we're heading, the rise of autocracy, the rise of strongman politics, the rise of mm -hmm. the backsliding of democratic governance, and the more centralization of power and the erosion of institutional governance. I think I think that will will stay with us for a long time. So whether it's Tucker Carlson here or you know or or mm -hmm. Le Pen in, in France, I um, think person in Denmark, the comments have added in Inger stuff. Oh, I won't try the name. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> I'm saying that, that the trend that we're seeing and where the world is heading and with now people questioning the, the, the sort of utility of democratic governance and how it's inefficient and how you can, so that right. I, I think will stay with us for, for quite a bit. And so while, you know, uh, sort of like, Others, I'm optimistic, obviously, uh, with, with a Biden, what, what will happen. But I do think the sort of the world that we live in now and the rise of not just China as an economic power, but its, it's governance model, the sort of authoritarian... Oh, it's corruption, isn't it, right? Like the dictators bring a kleptocracy, don't they? And here we have all the headlines, too, about, you know, all of the other you know, conflicts of interest. I mean, you mentioned the Attorney General. It's something I've, you know, been looking into a lot, a lot with my journalism. Is, and, and it runs so deep when every level you find there's these sort of backroom deals or discussions being done. And that's another reason why, um, you know, it, you, as uh, Ashley and I was chatting the other day, you have an election and the, the president changes overnight, but the culture doesn't. Um, the kleptocracy doesn't change overnight. Um, we, we have a really good question that's come in here, or, or two here. Um, thank you, by the way, to people tuning in. We've had um, Amandeep Midar has asked, are we yet to see worse of this strongman trend worldwide? That sort of touches on what you were saying. And I think Myanmar right now is a great example where they said, oh, you know, fake election. Um, it, it, stunning. And then we've got a great question, though, that adds to this here. So what is the antidote now to, you know, such strongman politics and um I, I think you know mohammed sultan you you had some very um good thoughts on on this um we were talking about you know wh where do we go from here how, how do we address this culture and i'm sure um you know the others you've got um i know ash has got some good thoughts on this as well you know mohammed? yeah i mean i think i think the remedy is uh insistence on democratic governance. I think we've seen this in the interim, in Biden's uh, interim uh, national security strategy, where the insistence on uh, uh, democratic governance, institutional governance, the role of civil society, uh, and as we sort of move from, again, this uh, unipolar world that we live in to a multipolar world, uh, with China challenging not just the uh, really ch like this exportation of this authoritarian capitalism, we have a defensive and an offensive uh, sort of battle ahead of us as the United States. Uh, and I think the promotion of, uh, not to say democracy promotion, because that's usually sort of paired with interventions and in all of this, but the insistence on democratic governance, on multilateral institutions, on uh, mm -hmm. the World War II, uh, liberal world, world order, and, uh, institutions, the multilateral institutions. I think that the insistence on um, the, the conditioning of our support, uh, very, very much so. I mean, it can't be, for example, that a country like Egypt, whose uh, leader is a strong man who has ruled with brute force, who's imprisoning tens of thousands of political prisoners, has eroded every sort of institutional governance is being, his regime is being subsidized with our tax dollars, $1.3 billion a year. And so there is, there is so much that, you know, sort of having this values-based doctrine that informs our partnerships or, and alliances on the international stage, uh, I think is a sort of a first step to, to remedy that. And while we obviously have a lot of work to do domestically and I'll, I'll, I'm sure others uh, uh, who are, you know, bigger experts on, on this uh, can speak to that. I think Matoya, did you want to add something or saw you? Otherwise I know I'm also 
Mohammed, you and I were talking about the macro versus micro sort of idea of how do you address that. And um, you had some really good thoughts on that, which I think resonated um, with, I mean, Asha, I really thought was very insightful when she was talking about this tribalism, right, that you've changed the culture now by this, you know, us versus them that does not change overnight. I mean, how do we address that? And um, Mohammed, I think, you you had some thoughts on on how we might go about that. Yeah, I'd love to hear Asha's th thoughts on 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 that and others. Uh... And yeah. you were saying, though, um, sorry, Mohammed, about sort of addressing the micro level of uh, of community relationships. But um, I want to hear your thoughts. Go on. <laughs> okay. uh, no, I just I. What sort of countries like Egypt, this is sort of uh, the societal decay on the sort of very, very micro familial level. I think we started to see that this, this last, uh, uh, this last Thanksgiving. And we, as family members in Egypt experienced that after the military coup of 2013, where different family members belong to different political ideologies and people didn't attend each other's weddings, funerals. Mm -hmm. and and we sort of saw a small semblance of that here in the United States where people at Thanksgiving dinner tables were having fights about who's, which side of the political debate they're on um, and in the years before that. And I sort of think that just like it has sort of macro effects, the micro effect, this fabric of society um, ripping and sort of the norms that have kept us civil and sort of being able to maintain relationships have sort of been severed because of the mm -hmm. political context being heightened and being so polarized. And I think that's a really slippery slope to go down. Yeah. Asha. Yeah. Um, the, what, what Mohammed is describing is basically a breakdown of social trust, right? And, and when you have tribalism, what you have is um, what political scientists and, and sociologists call um, a loss of generalized social trust. Generalized social trust is a sense of general positive regard and goodwill towards your fellow citizen, even though you don't know them, right? They're not in your tribe because you're oriented around uh, common uh, values. Um, so, you know, when you are united around higher principles, um, rule of law, freedom, equality. Um, you know, you have certain things that you feel bonded to as say Americans, even if you disagree politically. Um, and I think that's what we've seen a loss of. Um, and so, you know, building up, you know, civic institutions, I think civic education, which reinforces some of those, those common values is really important. Um, but, you know, that where we've seen this before in history is at the turn of the 20th century. Um, you know, during the Gilded Age, you had high income inequality, lots of xenophobia, um, you know, uh, monopolies. I mean, you know, the, the kind of tech companies now are what the industrials were back then. Um, right. And what, what brought us out of it was in the progressive era, uh, you know, civic uh, engagement, the women's suffrage movement, people working at the grassroots level to get their communities engaged, local involvement, um, local news, you know, like if, if people could get more involved in their communities, um, that's going to be the challenge because right now our screens suck up all our time. So we've really lost the ability to create these relationships that build trust, um, you know, whether it's through churches or the PTA or, you know, rotary clubs or whatever it is, like people don't do that anymore. Um, and I think that's what we're going to have to find a way to rebuild if, if we're going to have any kind of healthy fabric, um, social fabric. Mm. Yeah. And at the same time where we have a pandemic, it's obviously challenging all of those, um, you know, p potential methods. But also there's a, there's a really interesting question here from Amandeep Mita. Many countries created stringent pandemic laws which can easily become tools for authoritarian rule next. Any views on that if we have time? I think fortunately we do have time. We've got another 15 minutes or so. Um, I mean, that's 
you know, very interesting thinking how, yeah, the, the coronavirus context has, has played into this. Um, does anyone have any, any thoughts on that you want to add? Well, I know I would say that, um, you know, after 9-11, there were a number of laws that were passed relatively quickly that 